I guess you could say that the standard model of American history is that the U.S. was born of a righteous revolution against crushing British taxation and ruthless enforcement of that taxation. The revolution then ushered in a new government which was by and for the people, one that said all men were created equal, and the story goes that the new government was conceived in liberty to guarantee life, liberty, and um, property, or something to that effect. Britain fought a long, drawn-out war with the French uh, in the French and Indian War. The American colonies participated and benefited from the outcome of this war, but the funding was mainly British. The logistical issues with the war were surreal, and Britain was in a deal of debt after the war. To help pay off the debt, Britain imposed taxes on stamps, tea, sugar, and molasses, which was used to make rum. The tax on molasses was the biggie, as it was essentially a tax on rum. The British were taxing the colonists' booze, and that is something that wasn't taken lightly. This resulted in British approval rating dropping precipitously amongst the colonists. The local government, the Continental Congress, used British unpopularity as a moral justification to declare independence and raise an army through the printing of fiat currency, the Continental. Before the Declaration of Independence was even signed, George Washington had led the colonial army in a standoff at Boston, which was a stalemate for some time. During this stalemate, the Continental Congress ordered an, ordered an invasion of Francophonic Canada, French-speaking Canada, and expected the French would join the colonials. But the French weren't stupid and knew they would just be submitting to thugs they didn't know instead of the thugs they knew. The fact that when not faced with imminent British attack, the colonies attacked Canada is telling. If the goal was simple independence from British tyranny, why waste effort in Canada? And I know you will get rationalizations and long-winded justifications, but let's just deal with the facts. Let's not be fooled by the patterns on the draperies. Let's just look at the room. In 1781, the Articles of Confederation were signed. In 1783, the colonies won the war. And there were other countries that got involved, and Spain used the war as an opportunity to attack Gibraltar, but yeah, that's basically what happened. In 1787, the Constitution was ratified. Representatives at the Constitutional Convention claimed they needed a centralized government. Uh, this is odd, given that the colonies functioned just fine without much of a central government to speak of. In fact, the British soldiers, soldiers who arrived at the colonies marveled at the, col at the colonial wealth and the point of the war was to free the colonies from British central government and British arbitrary taxation. The members of the Constitutional Convention, who had the most to gain from a centralized government that could tax arbitrarily, advocated a central government that could tax arbitrarily. Arbitrarily, you know, they need to get so many votes or whatever. Again, just going with the facts here. I know there are long and wordy words in the Federalist Papers, and perhaps there were some idealists at that meeting, but we don't know that. To say the authors of the, of the Constitution were breed apart from modern politicians and weren't selfish sociopaths is not a fact, but conjecture. Okay, it's conjecture. And conjecture, which is inflicted upon children for 12 years at government education camps. In 1791, allegedly to pay for the war debt, the Continental Congress enacts a tax on rum, or actually a tax on all spirits and carriages. This tax was levied to pay for the war debt during the uh, French and Indian War, or I mean the, uh, um, the Revolutionary War against the British. Yeah, When the colonists resisted the tax violently in 1794, Congress assembled an army about the size of the one during the Revolutionary War. And because they didn't have to travel all the way across the Atlantic, they were able to easily crush the rebel forces. However, after the battles in Pennsylvania, uh, there were compliance problems all across the colonies. The government forces could beat the rebel armies anywhere they engaged, but couldn't occupy all the colonies. And so the people just didn't pay. The British had the same problem. They could beat the colonial army, but they couldn't occupy all the colonies. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. The government forces repealed the tax in 1803. Of course, Congress found some other way to pay off the debt. The tax on distilled spirits and carriages was never about paying off the war debt. They found some other way. 
If it was, then they certainly wouldn't have raised an army, which is an incredibly expensive enterprise to uh, collect the taxes. At the founding of the United States, the Barbary Coast would force ships that passage that uh, passed through its waters to pay tribute or be raided. The French and British governments just uh, made made uh, unilateral deals with the Barbary states and paid them off, but anyone else who wanted to get through the waters would have to pay a tribute. The U.S. government, no longer under the British aegis, decided to pay the Barbary states off. This was a toll. If you wished to pass through, you had to make arrangements with the Barbary states. You had to pay them off. Instead of having the people who wished to trade in the Middle East pay off the Barbary states, the U.S. government decided to pay the Barbary states off itself and guarantee safe passage for all U.S. ships. This was a subsidy. Okay, this was a subsidy for Middle Eastern trade, one which began in 1783. The U.S. government was subsidizing in 1783 and fought the first subsidy war of its own creation in 1801 and fought the second subsidy war in 1815. Thus, American Marines died and taxpayers paid for the wars just so merchants could make bigger profits. This was 14 years after ratifying the Constitution. During Britain's wars with Napoleon, they would impress U.S. citizens they found uh, on ships trying to get to France or whatever and block trade between America and France and its allies. This was driving Britain to war with the U.S. and was a very unpopular policy in Britain and in the United States. It was championed mainly by the Prime Minister at the time, Spencer Percival. As a result of this insane policy, Percival was assassinated on May 11, 1812. He was replaced by Lord Liverpool, who wanted to end the policy of conscripting colonial merchants. The United States declared war on Britain on June 18, 1812, and their first order of business was, you guessed it, an invasion of Canada. The American excuse is that Congress didn't get word of Percival's assassination until after June 18th. Let's assume that it took the ships 24 days to get from Britain to New York. Uh, that would give information of Percival's assassination 14 days to get to British ports, you know, within Britain, and then once they crossed the Atlantic from New, New York to Philadelphia. 38 days between the assassination and the declaration of war is cutting it exceptionally close. It's almost as if 38 days were enough for Congress to get word of Percival's death, but not enough of that information to filter to the general population. However, if the U.S. simply wanted to stop having their sailors impressed, the news of Percival's death would eventually reach them, at which point uh, they could stop the war and deal with a more reasonable Lord Liverpool. Of course, this is not what happened. And the fact that the U.S. invaded Canada as its first move is revealing. All arrows point to the War of 1812 as America's unsuccessful bid to get Canada, using Percival's impressment policy as an excuse, and the timing fits perfectly with the scenario that they wanted to get the war started before the, before the masses knew of Percival's death. Of course, uh, self-interested members of Congress claim the war was not for Canada, but that invading Canada was to be a bargaining chip. A bargaining chip... <laughs> A story was a story which doesn't fit as Lord Liverpool was already willing to bargain, not just bargain, but give up impressment altogether. Uh, former president at the time, uh, Thomas Jefferson, was more honest, saying the acquisition of Canada this year, as far as the neighbor neighborhood of Quebec, will be a mere matter of marching and will give us the experience for the attack on Halifax, the next and final expulsion of England from the American continent. In 1836, Texas ceded from Mexico. Mexico threatened to go to war over Texas if they joined the U.S., but in 1846, Texas called Mexico's bluff and joined uh, America. Mexico wasn't going to go to war with America, so they backed down. However, America demanded more than just the province of Texas and demanded parts of Chihuahua, uh, Coahuila, Tamaulipas, New Mexico, and a sliver of Alta California, Northern California. The U.S. based these claims on the Treaty of Alaska, which Mexico never signed. It's similar to someone writing something on a piece of paper and then punching someone in the face claiming it's okay because you have a treaty. 
Mexico defended its territories from the U.S.'s liberal definition of Texas, and the U.S. claimed Mexico was blocking, quote, Texan, close quote, independence, as if Mexico was looking for a fight with the U.S. I'm going to stop here, uh, as we all know that it just goes downhill from there. The point of this little essay was to make the case that there never was uh, a good time. There never were good old days. Just dealing with facts, just dealing with things that can be verified. Once you realize that pattern, that the patterns on the draperies are irrelevant, the room becomes a lot simpler. And when someone says we need to restore America, that falsely assumes that the United States was ever stored. The U.S. beginnings are no different than any other state. Take down the mythology, free yourself from characters and the propaganda inflicted by government education camps. The shit of today is the shit of the past. Don't be fooled by sacred cows.